Part 3 Chapter 33 January of that year was too cold and dry for snow. It was a month of frozen hardness, of ice. Maniac drifted from hour to hour, day to day, alone with his memories, a stunned and solitary wanderer. He ate only to keep from starving, warmed his body only enough to keep it from freezing to death, ran only because there was no reason to stop. Even if the superintendent had allowed it, he could not have brought himself to stay at the band shell. He returned only long enough to pick up a few things, a blanket, some non-perishable food, the glove, and as many books as he could squeeze into the old black satchel that had hauled Grayson's belongings around the minor leagues. Before he left for good, he got some paint and angrily brushed over the 101 on the door. During the days he ran, usually a slow jog, but sometimes he would suddenly sprint furious ten or twenty second bursts as though trying to leave himself behind. Sometimes he walked. He crossed and recrossed the river. He wandered in all directions through all the surrounding communities and townships, Bridgeport, Conchocton, East Nortonton, West Nortonton, Jeffersonville, Plymouth, Worcester. Whenever he crossed the bridge over the Schuylkill, he turned his eyes so as not to see the nearby P&W trestle. Even so, in his mind's eye, he saw the red and yellow trolley careening from the high track, plunging to the water, killing his parents over and over. After a while, he stopped crossing the bridge. Other than that, he went wherever there was room to go forward, along roads and alleys and railroad tracks, across fields and cemeteries and golf courses. From high above, a tracing of his routes would have looked as hopelessly tangled as Cobble's knot. By nightfall, he was back in two mills. He would retrieve the satchel from wherever he had sashed it and find a place to endure the night. A few times he revisited the buffalo pen, where he covered himself with a second blanket of straw. Other times his overnight quarters might be an abandoned car, an empty garage, a basement stairwell. When his original supply of food ran out, he fed himself at the zoo or at the soup kitchen down at the Salvation Army. He did odd jobs for housewives, ran errands for shopkeepers. He would not beg. One day he found himself among monuments in Cannon and rolling, rolling hills. He was in Valley Forge. Here the Continental Army had suffered through a winter of their own, and the vast, stark, frozen desolation itself seemed a more proper monument than statues and stones. The only buildings here were tiny log-and-mortar cabins, replicas of the Army's shelters. Maniac could feel the ache swelling outward from his breast and filling the enormous, bounding spaces. He returned to town for the satchel and put himself up in one of the cabins. It was scarcely bigger than a large doghouse. The floor was dirt. There was a doorway, but no door. Several saltines fell from the blanket. He threw them outside. Let the birds have them. He wrapped himself in the blanket and lay down. He lay there all night and all the next day. Dreams pursued memories, courted and danced and coupled with them, and they became one and the gaunt, beseeching phantoms that called to him had the rag rat feet of Washington's regulars, and the faces of his mother and father, and Aunt Dot and Uncle Dan, and the Beals, and Earl Grayson. In that bedeviled army there would be no more recruits. No one else would orphan him. The second evening came and went. Maniac never stirred. Knowing it would not be fast or easy, and wanting, deserving nothing less, grimly, patiently, he waited for death. Chapter 34 It was during the second night in the cabin that he heard the little voices. They were not soldiers' voices. I'm going in this one. No, that one. That one's bigger. I'm tired. I'm stopping. You stupid meatball. It's right there. Another two seconds. I'm staying. Great, you beef jerky. Stay. I'm going to that one. Good night. Silence, then. Hold on, I'm coming. That was all. The ghostly soldiers returned, their haunted eyes seeking warmth, food, life. There was no morning, only daylight in the doorway. He pushed himself up, dragged himself outside into the blinding light. The saltines lay in the brown, frozen grass. The next cabin was nearby. January slipped an icy finger under his collar and down his back. He pulled the blanket tighter about himself, but it was too late. The finger had touched the last warm coal in his hearth, and his body, fanning the ember, shook itself violently. He walked to the next cabin, looked inside, and saw a body huddled in the corner. An eye opened, stared at him. Then, in succession, three more eyes opened. The body divided and became two, two little boys. "'Get a load of this meatball,' said the one with the front tooth missing. 
He walks around with a blanket on. Hey, Meatball, why ain't you bring your mattress along, too? And your pillow, too, screeched the other. Then Missing Tooth whipped off his woolen cap and smacked Screecher in the face. Screecher retaliated. The maniac had to step back while the two kid tornadoes swirled around the cabin. When they finished, they rolled onto their backs, shook their legs to the ceiling, and laughed as long as they had fought. The volume coming from Screecher was incredible, as though a microphone were embedded in his throat. Finally, Missing Tooth rediscovered the stranger standing in the doorway. Hey, Meatball, you running away too? No, not really, Maniac replied. Well, we are, went Screecher. Where are you going? asked Maniac. The answer came from both. Mexico! Maniac bit back a grin. When they stood, he saw they couldn't have been more than four feet tall or eight years old. Well, he said, it's good and warm down there, but it's pretty far, you know. Yeah, we know, growled Missing Tooth. You think we're meatballs like you? He grabbed a supermarket bag in the corner, opened it. Look! It was filled with candy, cupcakes, pies, even a pack of butterscotch crimpets. Maniac's stomach rasped against itself. He remembered how thirsty he was. Where'd you get all this? We stole it, Screecher blurted. The other smacked him with his cap. Shut up, Piper, you stupid sausage. You don't go telling people you stole stuff. Piper returned the cap slap. You shut up, Russell. I didn't tell him where we stole it. This time, the fight was over in less than a minute. But it started up again when my maniac asked where they were from. And Piper said, two mills. And Russell said, shut up. He might be a cop. And bopped him good. When they settled down, they stared at him warily. Piper snickered. He ain't no cop. He's a kid. Yeah, sneered Russell. That's how much you know. They got cops that look like kids. That's how they catch kids. They stared at him some more. They moved in cautiously, one on either side. They opened his blanket. They patted him all over. What are you doing this for? Piper wanted to know. We're feeling him for a gun, Russell explained. Oh. After patting, they backed off. So, said Russell, you ain't a cop. Not me, said Maniac. He moved in from the doorway. I'm and with only a moment's pause, the story came to him. A pizza delivery boy. We have a contest every week, and you two were chosen for a free pizza. The two gaped at each other. We were? Yep, a large. Where is it? demanded Russell, glancing round. At Cobble's Corner. You have 24 hours to claim your prize. He waited while they bickered over what to do. Valley Forge was a good five or six miles from two mills. These kids might not have made it to Mexico, but they'd come a long way and stayed out overnight, and someone somewhere must be worried sick about them, and he had a feeling they weren't kidding about stealing the food. He figured he'd better help them make up their minds. You know, he said, you're taking the long way to Mexico. If you come back to two mills with me, I'll show you a shortcut. That did it. Soon the three of them were trekking past the Washington Memorial Chapel, Russell and Piper with their bag, Maniac with his satchel. It was early afternoon when they walked into Cobble's Corner at Hector and Birch. Maniac produced a certificate for conquering Cobble's Knot, and twenty minutes later the young runaways were attacking a large pizza with pepperoni. Maniac confined himself to three glasses of water and half a dozen crimpets. The boys agreed with Maniac that they ought to stay the night in their own house before settling out for Mexico in the morning. They were barely a block from Cobble's when Maniac heard a familiar voice. Bellowing and barreling down the street with a fearsome fastballer, King of the Cobras, Big John McNabb himself, and he was roaring mad. Maniac might have taken off, but he found himself clung to and clutched by the two little urchins. They huddled behind him like babies on a possum's back as Giant John came red-faced and huffing up to them. Where you been? he yelled. As Maniac considered what to say, the urchins peeped from behind him. We wasn't no place, John. We was right here with this here kid, and he ain't no cop neither. We checked him out. For the first time, Giant John looked straight at Maniac. A smile crossed his face. Well, well, the frogman. The smile vanished. So what are you doing with my little brothers? Chapter 35 It took a while for everything to get straightened out. First, Giant John had to be convinced that Maniac was not kidnapping his brothers. Then, the brothers had to do some more trembling and clinging while John finished lambasting them for running away, which apparently they did about every other week. Then, when the brothers found out that their pizza person was none other than the famous Maniac McGee, the very same one who had blasted their big brother's fastballs to smithereens and finished him off with a home-run frog, well, it took a good five minutes of rolling on the sidewalk to get all the laughing out of their systems, which, of course, got Giant John more than a little steamed, prompting Maniac, 
who didn't like seeing John disgraced before his little brothers, to say, Yeah, but didn't John tell you what happened the next day? And the brothers said, No, what? And Giant John said, Huh? The maniac winked at John and crossed his fingers. Sure, John, you remember, wink, wink, at the Little League field the next day. You said I was lucky that all you threw me was fastballs, because you weren't ready to reveal your secret pitch, the one you'd been working on. Remember? Wink. McNabb nodded dumbly. And so I said, well, come on, I can hit anything. Pitch it to me. And you pitched it, and I missed it by a mile. And you kept pitching it to me all day long, and I never even hit a foul ball on it. What was the pitch? What was the pitch? chanted the urchins. It was, Maniac sought for dramatic buildup, the stop ball. The stop ball? Yeah, and you should have seen it. It comes right up to the plate, looking all fat and easy to belt. And then, just when you take your swing, Maniac got into his batter stance and demonstrated. It sort of stops, and your bat just whiffs the air. He whiffed at an imaginary stop ball. Wow, said the brothers gazing up at their big brother. And so Maniac was invited to accompany the brothers McNabb to their home. Despite the cold, the front door was wide open, and Maniac could smell the inside before he could see it. The first thing he did was did see was a yellow, short-haired mongrel looking innocently up at him while taking a leak in the middle of the living room floor. Clean that up, John ordered Russell. Clean that up, Russell ordered Piper. Piper just walked on by. After closing the front door, which was surprisingly heavy, Maniac found a stack of newspapers in a corner. He laid some over the puddle to soak in, then gave himself a tour of the downstairs. Maniac had seen some amazing things in his lifetime, but nothing as amazing as that house. From the smell of it, he knew this wasn't the first time an animal had relieved itself on the rugless floor. In fact, in another corner, he spotted a form of relief that could not be soaked up by newspapers. Cans and bottles lay all over along with crusts, peelings, cores, scraps, rinds, wrappers, everything you would normally find in a garbage can. And everywhere, there were raisins. As he walked through the dining room, something, an old tennis ball, hit him, from top, hit him on top of the head and bounced away. He looked up into the laughing faces of Russell and Piper. The hole in the ceiling was so big they both could have jumped through it at once. He ran a hand along the walls, one wall. The peeling paint came off like cornflakes. Nothing could be worse than the living room and dining rooms, yet the kitchen was. A jar of peanut butter had crashed to the floor. Someone had gotten a running start, jumped into it, and skied a brown, one-footed track to the stove. On the table were what appeared to be the remains of an autopsy performed upon, upon a large bird, possibly a crow. The refrigerator contained two food groups, mustard and beer. The raisins here were even more abundant. He spotted several of them moving. They weren't raisins. They were roaches. The front door opened, and seconds later, a man clomped into the kitchen. He wore no winter coat, only a sleeveless green sweatshirt, which ballooned over his enormous stomach. Tattoos blued his upper arms. His hands were nearly pure black. Stale body odor mingled with that of fries and burgers coming from the Burger King bag he held. Dropping the bag next to the bird remains, he bellowed, Chow! and took a beer from the fridge. He downed a good half of it in one swig belched, double-clutched, and belched again. He had to know if someone besides himself was standing in the kitchen, and just as obviously, he didn't care. Two floor-quaking crashes came from the dining room. Geronimo! Geronimo! Russell and Piper had taken the direct route via the hole. What'd you bring, Dad? Whoppers? Yeah, whoppers! They tore into the bag like jackals into carry-on. Plastic flew, fries flew. They both wanted the same whopper. Mashed between their tugging fists, the Whopper splurted sauce and cheese and pickle chips. Then it split. Russell lurched backwards into the kitchen table with his half. Piper lurched backward into the opposite direction, and with nothing to stop him, sailed right through the cellar door and down the cellar steps. The final thud was followed by the truck horn blast of Piper's lap. When Giant John ambled in, the father said, Get the blocks. No, grunted John, pulling out a pair of Whoppers. He tossed one to Maniac. We need more, growled the father. John didn't answer. We need more, I heard. McNabb smashed the tabletop. Three fries and a bird wing jumped to the floor. Now! John walked out nonchalantly munching. I was busy. The rest of the night seemed, was scenes from a loony movie. Scene. McNabb the father swaggers bare-armed out the front door, bellowing back, Do your homework! 
Scene. Maniac retrieves a wet newspaper from the living room. There are no waste baskets in the house. He finds a trash can in the backyard, next to a pile of cinder blocks. He dumps the soggy papers into the can, which is empty. Scene. Small turds of an unfamiliar shape appear here and there along the baseboards of the first floor. Please don't be rats, Maniac prays. Scene. The cobras come in. They glare at Maniac, but Giant John tells them to lay off. They raid the fridge, fridge for beer. They smoke cigarettes. They belch and fart. They curse. Russell and Piper, kitty cobras, pop their own beer cans, guzzle, swagger, belch, smoke, curse. Scene. Football game. From the front of the living room to the back of the dining room, except for the space, it is everything a regular game has. Running, passing, blocking, tackling, kicking. There is little furniture to get in the way. Ordinarily, the windows wouldn't last five minutes. But the windows of this house are boarded up with plywood. Body block cobras fly into the walls. The house flinches. Scene. A faint rustling noise behind the stove. Oh no, rats! Maniac dares to look. It's a turtle, a box turtle, munching on old wrapper, whopper lettuce. Phew! Scene. The boys' bedroom. Russell and Piper lie prone at the hole. They fire toy submachine guns ta -da -ta -da -ta -ta -ta, at the cobras heading out the front door. Piper jumps up and blows Maniac away, killing him at least 15 times. This is how we're going to do it. Bam, 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 bam! The guns will be real, says Russell, still prone and firing. The sock of the toy gun tight against his cheek. Yeah, squawks Piper. Real. He flops back to the floor, sprays the hole downstairs. Soon as they start coming, in. Bam, 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 bam. Who, says Maniac. The enemy, says Russell. Who's that, says Maniac. Russell stops firing long enough to send Maniac a, where you been, look. Who do you think, he sneers. He points the red barrel of the submachine gun toward the bedroom, toward the east, the east end, the heavy front door. Scene. Darkness. Silence. Sometime early morning. Maniac lies between the two brothers on the bed. Do cockroaches climb bedposts? Unable to sleep, asking himself, what am I doing here? Remembering Hester and Lester on his lap, Grayson's hug, corn muffin in the toaster oven, thinking, who's the orphan here anyway? Hearing as, it, as he at last lowers himself into sleep's deep waters, a door slam, a slurred voice, do your homework. Fearing, will I float? Chapter 36 The deal was, if Russell and Piper went to school for the rest of the week, the maniac would show them the shortcut to Mexico on Saturday. He figured if they all managed to survive till then, he'd come up with something. On Saturday, the boys had their paper bag packed, and maniac had a new deal. Go to school for another week, and he'd treat them to another large pizza. Besides, he said, crossing his fingers, this was volcano season down in Mexico. The whole place was a sheet of red-hot lava. Better wait till it cools down. They bought it. And they bought the same deal the following week. But school was still agony for the boys. It had to be worth more than a pizza a week. But what? The brothers thought and thought about it and soon began to realize that the answer was sleeping between them every night. Ever since the famous maniac McGee had showed up at their house, Russell and Piper McNabb had become famous in their own right. Other kids were always crowding around, pelting them with questions. What's he like? What's he say? What's he do? Did he really sit on Finsterwald's front steps? Is he really that fast? Kids started giving them knots, sneaker laces, yo-yo strings, toys, and saying, Ask the maniac to undo this, will ya? Really little kids referred to him as Mr. Maniac. The McNabs ate it up. In the streets, the playground, school. The attention, not the pizza, was the real reason they put up with school each day. They began to feel something they'd never felt before. They began to feel important. What a wonderful thing, this importance. Waiting for them the moment they awoke in the morning, pumping them up like basketballs, giving them bounce. And they hadn't even had to steal it. They loved it. The more they had, the more they wanted. And so, when Maniac tried to cut the next pizza for school deal, Russell answered, No. No? echoed Maniac, who'd been afraid it would come to this. No, said Russell. We want something else. Oh, said Maniac. What's that? They told him. If he wanted another week's worth of school out of them, he would have to enter Finsterwald's backyard and stay there for ten minutes, screeched Piper, who shuddered at the very thought. When Maniac casually answered, Okay, it's a deal. Piper ran shrieking from the house. On the next Saturday morning, Russell, Piper, and Maniac set out for Finsterwald's house about seven blocks away. They took the alleys. Along the way, they were joined by other kids, who were waiting, their eyes at once fearful and excited. 
By the time they got to Finsterwald's backyard, at least fifteen kids huddled against the garage door on the far side of the alley. Maniac didn't hesitate. He walked straight up to the back gate, opened it, and went in. Not only that, he went all the way to the center of the yard, turned, folded his arms, smiled, and called, Who's keeping time? Russell, his throat too dry to speak, raised his hand. For ten minutes, fifteen kids, and possibly the universe, held their breath. The only sounds were the inside were inside their heads, the moaning and wailing of the ghosts of all the poor slobs who'd ever blundered onto Finsterwald's property. To the utter amazement of awe, when Russell finally croaked, Time! Maniac McGee was still there, alive, smiling, apparently unharmed. Even more amazing, he didn't come out. Instead, he said, Say, you guys, how about adding to the deal? If I do something else while I'm here, will you make it the next two weeks at school? What a... What are you going to do? stammered Russell. Maniac thought for a minute, then announced brightly, I'll knock on the front door. Five kids finster on the spot. Several others screamed, No, don't! Piper went into some sort of fit and began kicking the garage door. Russell zoned out. Maniac took all of this to signify a deal. He hopped the backyard fence and strolled around the front. The others went back down the alley and around the long way. They stationed themselves not only across the street, but almost halfway up the block. And even then, they squeezed together in a bunch, as though if they allowed any space between them, Finsterald might somehow pick them off one by one. They huddled, trembling to bear witness to the last seconds of Maniac McGee's life. They saw him stand directly in front of the red brick three-story house, the bile green window shades. They saw him climb the three cement steps, steps to the white door, the portal of death. They saw him raise his hand, and though they were too far away to hear, they saw him knock upon the door, and fifteen heartbeats in time to that silent knocking. The door opened. Finsterwald's door opened. Not much, but enough, so the witnesses could make out a thin strip of blackness. Would Maniac be sucked into that black hole like so much lint into a vacuum cleaner? Would Finsterwald's long, bony hand dart out, quick as a lizard's tongue, and snatch poor Maniac? Maniac appeared to be speaking to the dark crack. Was he pleading for his life? Would his last words be skewed like a marshmallow by Finsterwald's dagger-tipped cane? Apparently not. The door closed. Maniac bounded down the steps and came jogging toward them, grinning. Three kids bolted, sure he was a ghost. The others stayed. They invented excuses to touch him, to see if he was still himself, still warm. But they weren't positively certain until later, when they watched him devour a pack of butterscotch crimpets. Chapter 37 Thus began a series of heroic feats by Maniac McGee. At twenty paces he hit a telephone pole with a stone sixty-one times in a row. When the once-a-week freight train hit Elm Street, he started running from the Oriel Street dead end on one rail and beat the train to the park, no sweat. He took off his sneaks and socks and walked nonchalant as you please through the rat-infested dump at the foot of Rako Hill. The mysterious hole down by the creek, the one you would never reach into, even if you dropped your most valuable possession into it, he stuck his hand in, his arm in, all the way to the elbow, kept it there for the longest sixty seconds on record, and pulled it out, dirty but still full of fingers. He climbed the fence at the American bison pen at the zoo. He had suggested this feat himself, everyone else scoffing, and while the mother looked on, kissed the baby buffalo. So it went through February and March of that year, a feat a week. To much of the town, hearing about these things, it was simply a case of the legend adding to itself, doing what legends do. To Russell and Piper McNabb, it was a case of boosting their importance even higher in the eyes of the other kids. Was it not at the brother's direction that Maniac performed these deeds? And who, after all, is the more amazing, the lion or the tamer? As for Maniac, he understood early on that he was being used for the greater glory of Russell and Piper. He also understood that without him, they would not be going to school every day. For the McNabs, there was nothing free about public education. A tuition had to be paid. Every week, Maniac paid it. And besides, he loved to meet the challenges they cooked up for him. And then one day, they gave him the most perilous challenge of all. They dared him to go into the East End. Chapter 38 The Witnesses, there were twice fifteen this time, went with him as far as Hector Street. They halted at the curb. They crossed the street, or he crossed the street, and went on alone. Piper megaphoned after him. Maniac, c come back. We were just kidding. You don't have to. Maniac just waved and went on. 
He knew he should be feeling afraid of these East Enders, these so-called black people, but he wasn't. It was himself he was afraid of, afraid of any trouble he might cause just by being there. It was the day of the worms, that first almost warm after the rainy night day in April when you bolt from your house to find yourself in a world of worms. They were as numerous here in the East End as they had been in the West. The sidewalks, the streets, the very places where they didn't belong. Forlorn, marooned on concrete and asphalt, no place to burrow. April's orphans. Once when he was little in Hollidaysburg, he had gone along with his toy wheelbarrow, carefully lifting them with a borrowed kitchen fork until the barrel was full, then dumped them into Mr. Snavely's compost pile. And sure as the worms followed the rain, the kids followed the worms. West End, East End. They had poured from their houses onto the cool, damp sidewalks, and if they gave the worms any notice, it was only when they squashed one underfoot. And so as Maniac moved through the East End, he felt the presence of not one, but two populations, both occupying the same territory, yet each unmindful of the other, one yelping and playing and chasing and laughing, the other lost and silent and dying by the millions. Yo, fish belly! Maniac snapped too. He glanced at the street sign. He was four, four blocks from Hector, deep in the east. Mars bars came dip-jiving toward him, taller than before, bigger, but still scowling. Hey, fish, thought you was gone! Maniac turned to face him fully. Mars Bars did not stop till he was inside Maniac's phone booth of space, inches from his face. They locked eyes, levelly, Maniac thinking, I must be grown too. He said, I'm back. The scowl fiercened. Maybe nobody told you. I'm badder than ever. I'm getting badder every day. I'm almost afraid to wake up in the morning, he leaned in closer, cause of how bad I might have got overnight. Maniac smiled, nodded. Yeah, you're bad, Mars. He gave a sniff. His smile went a little smirky. And I'm getting so bad myself, I think I must be half black. Mars' eyes bulged. He backed off. The scowl collapsed, and he howled with laughter. His buddies, who were hanging back, stared dumbly. As Mars unwound from his laughing fit, he studied Maniac up and down, aware, too, that Maniac was studying him. When he could speak again, he said, Still them raggedy clothes, huh, fish? He lifted one foot, posed. I see you looking like them kicks. Just got em. Maniac nodded. Nice. They were more than nice. They were beautiful. The best, yes, the bad sneaks he'd ever seen. Way better than anything Grayson could have afforded. I forgot to tell you something else, too, fish. What's that? I'm fast. I mean, I'm faster. I've been working out. Got my new boss kicks. He sprinted in place, arms and legs p pistoning to a blur. He stopped. He jabbed a finger at Maniac's nose pressed it, flattening the soft end of it. See? Guess you were right. Now at least you got a black nose. He laughed. They both laughed. Everybody laughed. Then Mars Bars turned scowling again, saying, But you ain't black enough or bad enough to beat the Mars man. We gonna race, honky donkey. The race was set up on Plum Street, the long, level block between Ash and Jackson. By the time they were ready, half the kids in the East End were there, from the tiniest pipsqueaks to high schoolers. The little kids ran races of their own from curb to curb. The bigger kids shouldered blastered blasters and dug into their jeans for coins to bet with. For the first time since last fall, mothers opened windows and leaned out from second stories. Traffic was detoured from both ends of the block. Noah could find string for the finish, so a second-story mother dropped down a spool of bright pink thread. Another problem was the start. First they had to find chalk to draw the starting line. When they did, nobody could seem to draw it straight. The result, a stack of starting lines creeping up the street till somebody brought out a yardstick and did it right. The next problem came with this when the starter, Bump Gilliam, who was also Mars Bar's best pal, called, Get ready! And someone in the crowd yelled, That ain't what you say! You say take your mark! Well, everybody jumped into it then. There was shoving and jawing and almost a fistfight over the proper way to start a race. Finally, there was a compromise, and Bump called, Get ready on your mark! At which point, somebody else called, Go Mars! And Bump turned and snarled, Shut up! When the starter starts, there's no noise. So naturally, someone else called, Smoke a Mars! And then came, Waste a Mars! And, Do the honk, mar bar man! And then, might still be calling to this day, had not a single voice separated itself from the others. Burn him, McGee! It was hands down, laughing and pointing from his perch on the roof of a car. Bump jumped into the let-up. Get set! 
Go! And at long last, mossy from their weight at the starting line, they went. And even as the race began, even after it began, Maniac wasn't sure how to run it. Naturally, he wanted to win, or at least do his best. All his instincts told him that. But there were other considerations, whom he was racing against, and where, and what the consequences might be if he won. These were heavy considerations, heavy enough to slow him down, until the hysterical crowd and the sight of Mars Bar sneaker bottoms and the boiling of his own blood ignited his afterburners, and before you could say, Burn him, McGee, he was ahead, the pink thread bobbing in his sights. But he never saw his body break the thread. He saw only the face of Mars Bar straining, gasping, unbelievingly losing. They went crazy, they went wild, they went totally bananas. You see him? He turned around. He ran backwards. He did it backwards. He beat him going backwards. Mars Bars tried. He shoved Bump. You started too fast. I wasn't ready. He shoved the thread holders. You moved it up so he could win. I was gaining on him. He shoved Maniac. You bumped me. You had a false start. You cheated. But his protest drowned in the pandemonium. Why did I do it? was all Maniac could think. He hadn't even realized it till he crossed the line, and he regretted it instantly. Wasn't it enough just to win? Did he have to disgrace his opponent as well? Had he done it deliberately to pay back Mars Bars for all his nastiness? To show him up and to shut him up once and for all? His only recollection was a feeling of sheer joyful exuberance, himself in, celebrating, in celebration, shouting, Amen! in the Bethany Church, bashing John McNabb's fastballs out of sight, dancing the polka with Grayson. Maybe it was that simple. After all, who asks why otters toboggan down mud banks? But that didn't make it any less stupid or a rotten thing to do. The hatred in Mars Bar's eyes was no longer for a white kid in the East End. It was Jeff for Jeffrey McGee, period. The crowd surged with him as he made his way westward. It wasn't clear whether they were glad or not that he had won, only that they had seen something to set them off. They jostled and jammed and high-fived and jived, for every one who called him White Lightning, two more challenged him to race. Right here, baby, you and me. See who's going to turn his back on who. Maniac kept moving, embarrassed, wishing he could just break out and sprint for the West End, wishing he could duck into the Beals' house and be sanctuary there and not fear reprisals on them. And just about then, miraculously, two little hands were worming into his, two familiar faces squealing, Maniac, Maniac, Hester and Lester. He snatched them up, one in each arm, he was on Sycamore Street. There was the house, the door opening, Amanda, Mrs. Beal, smiling to beat the band. Chapter 39 During the night, March double-backed and grabbed April by the scruff of the neck and flung it another week or two down the road. When Maniac slipped silently from the house at dawn, the only way he'd ever managed to get away, March pounced with cold and nasty paws. But Maniac wasn't minding. The reunion had been ecstatic and tearful and non-stop happy, and inside he was pure July. He was half a block up Sycamore before he stopped tiptoeing. Minutes later he crossed Hector. The streets were dry. An occasional scrap of chewed rawhide was all that remained of the worms. Hours later, Russell and Piper spotted him three bucks blocks off. Maniac, you're alive! We thought they got you. We thought they slit your throat. We thought they strangled you and pulled your tongue out. We thought they'd chop your head off and, and, and boiled ya. Yeah, boiled ya. And drunk your blood. Yeah, and drunk your brains. You don't drink brains, you moron meatball. Yeah, you do. Brains are like milkshakes, like Dairy Queen. You can drink them with a straw. You can hear them sloshing if you shake your head hard enough. Listen. Hey, get off my head. Hey, help. They were off and running. Maniac couldn't help laughing. In spite of their twisted, ludicrous impressions of East Enders, the concern and tears in their eyes had been genuine. They had really missed him. They had really been afraid for him. Two houses away, he could hear the thump, almost feel it, and Father George McNabb's voice, Lay him down easy, I said easy, followed by son, son John, This easy enough? Thump, followed by a string of curses from George McNabb that fried the cold morning like an egg. The living room was hazy with dust. At the back end of the dining room, they were bringing in the cinder blocks, George and John and a handful of cobras, lugging and grunting them in front, in from the backyard, and dumping them onto the floor. Thump, thump. Hey, kid. George McNabb was pointing through the haze. Three months, and he still didn't know his tenant's name. Get your lily hide over here. Start lugging these. Maniac waved. Later. Gotta go. He shut the door and headed up the street. So they were really doing it. He had heard them planning it for weeks. 
making drawings, buying or stealing cement, trowels, a level, a pillbox, they called it. Once it was done, they'd be ready. Let the revolt begin. Let the rebels, as they called the, the East Enders, come. Let them bust through the newly installed bars over the plywood on the windows. Let them bust through the steel door. They'll find themselves staring down the barrel of a little surprise. They squabbled over what the surprise should be. Uzi, AK-47, bazooka. Why? Maniac asked Giant John one day. Why what? Why are you doing all this? To get ready, what else? Well, what do you think's going to happen? What's going to happen? Giant John swatted a squad of roaches from the kitchen table and sat down. What's going to happen is, one of these days, they're going to revolt. Who says? Who cares who says? You think they're going to make an announcement? Maniac tried to picture Amanda and Hester and Lester and Bow Wow storming the barricades. When all's this supposed to happen? John shrugged. You never know. Maybe this summer. He jumped up, grabbed a beer from the fridge, flipped it open. They like to revolt in the summer. Makes them itchy. They like to overrun the cities. This time, we'll be ready. And he told Maniac what he often imagined lying in bed. The black sweeping across Hector, one street, one steaming summer night. Torches, chains, blades, guns, war cries, marooting, looting, overrunning the West End, climbing in through smashed windows, doors, looking for whites, bloodthirsty for whites, like Indians in the old days, Indians on a raid. That's what they are, Giant John nodded thoughtfully. Today's Indians. The cockroach strolling up his pant leg wasn't the only thing making Maniac feel crawly. He shook off the roach. He moved to the center of the kitchen to surround himself with as much space as possible. But other people, he said, I don't hear them talking about revolts. Nobody else wants to make a pillbox. Giant John tilted the last of the beer into his mouth. Maybe when we do, he grinned, they will. That had been weeks before, and now the pillbox was underway. No longer an idea in the backyard, but a reality in the dining room. Now there was no room that Maniac could stand in the middle of and feel clean. Now there was something else in that house, and it smelled worse than garbage and turds.